They had names for their flying machines, names like Silverwings, Comet, and Swallow. They had dreams of soaring above the earth, flying through the air, and entertaining those below. There were others who had dreams too, dreams of turning a city, sometimes known as the peerless princess of the prairie, into an airplane manufacturing center. Their dreams came together and came true in Wichita, Kansas, the air capital of the world. Wichita, the air capital. It's a logo that Wichitans grew up with. Perhaps some take it too much for granted. But how did it come about? And who were those aviation pioneers who helped make it happen? And what is it about Wichita that set it up for such a name, such a claim, a name that historians to this day say this city is deserving of? We've built more airplanes here than any place else in the world. So yes, we are, we own that name. North Carolina says they were the home of flight. But you know, I really believe that aviation grew up and was raised in Wichita, Kansas. Just a very rich tradition of making things, building things, and serving that industry. Just due to the concentration of employees and production and factories and airplanes. The aviation industry at its outset was here because the conditions were right. There were people here that wanted to uh, underwrite it. But Wichita was in the right place at the right time with the right people. Right place, right people, right time, says noted aviation author and historian Ed Phillips, whom we'll be hearing a lot from through the course of this documentary. Right place, time, and people, a winning formula then and now, making Wichita the air capital of the world. Before we get into Wichita's aviation era, let's find out just a little bit about what Wichita was like leading up to its air capital roots. In Wichita's early days, it was a cow town. Cattle drives followed the Chisholm Trail, started by Jesse Chisholm in present-day Wichita, and went through Oklahoma and into Texas. The cattle collected in large stockyards here to be shipped off by rail to northern cities. Years later, Wichita actually laid claim to being the broom corn capital of the world. Wichita wasn't the only location making that claim. But on December 17, 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright ushered in the era of flight with their first successful flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. That spawned a fascination for flying around the world as well as right here in Kansas and Wichita. Because we go back almost to the Wright brothers' first flight, all of the, almost all of the early pioneers like Clyde Cessna and Walter Beach and Stearman and Laird and all those guys were in the Midwestern area and they came to Wichita for a lot of good aerodynamic reasons. First of all, it's flat here. Secondly, the weather is pretty good. Third, we have the wind that they need because they didn't have very big engines and as you know, flying is relative wind. And we had people here who were really good at making things with their hands. People good at making things with their hands. Why, that sounds like Clyde Vernon Cessna. Cessna was born in Iowa, but his parents moved the family to Kansas, settling on a farm near Rago in Kingman County. Educated through the fifth grade, Cessna later got a good reputation for being able to fix neighbors' farm equipment and get it running again. Those skills would later serve him well at repairing his airplanes he would crash so often while trying to master the skill of flying. I think Clyde was frankly the uh, number one reason we've become the air capital because he was uh, the first of that entire group to fly again. He flew eight years after the Wright brothers' first flight, which is incredible to me. Cessna had a small farm in Kingman County, but it wasn't long before he noticed a young school teacher by the name of Europa Elizabeth Dotzer who got her teaching education at McPherson College, then started teaching in Kingman County. They fell in love and married. Clyde's interests soon turned from farming to the new technologies of that day. At first, automobiles caught his attention. Clyde and Europa moved to Harper, where he was hired first as a mechanic, then to sell cars at the Overland Farm dealership there. The Harper dealership closed in 1908, so Clyde moved the family to Enid, Oklahoma, where he became a partner in the Overland dealership there. Cessna did well at selling cars in Enid, 
well enough to finance a new interest of his, flying. That's really where he began his aviation career was in Enid. Cessna was already making a name for himself in Enid, selling cars to a public ready to transition from horses and buggies to automobiles. Before long, he became manager with the company bearing his name. Cessna heard about a flying exhibition taking place in Oklahoma City in 1911, where a French Blériot monoplane would be flying. It was Clyde's first time to witness man flight. Clyde says, a farmer, Rago, Kansas, and then in 1911, he saw an ad for an air show, an exhibition in Oklahoma City. And the reason he wanted to go and see it is he had been reading about airplanes. The enthusiasm that exhibition generated changed the course of Cessna's life, starting him, his family, and others on a new course. But he went to Oklahoma City and he saw uh, the Moissants fly and some others who were there, and he was just very enamored with that airplane. The next thing he did took it one step farther. He went to New York City and he worked for the Queen Airplane Company to learn how airplanes went together. For Clyde Cessna, for example, to read in the Tulsa World one day about uh, a replica of the Blériot airplane that uh, Blurio had flown across the English Channel, get on a train, go to New York, buy a replica of that airplane. Had no engine, had no propeller, he had no flying experience, but it was intriguing to him. And he took the airplane back and he and his brother carved a propeller, uh, tried two or three engines, and he spent the better part of a year uh, and, and had a number of accidents. While in New York, Cessna spent a few weeks on the factory assembly line, watching and learning how the plane was built. And the airplane that was going to be built for John Moissant, he ended up with that because Moissant was killed. When Moissant was killed, Cessna bought his airplane less the engine. He had the plane he purchased for $7,500 boxed and shipped by rail to Enid. Clyde named the plane Silver Wings after the color of its wings. Everyone in Enid could hardly wait to see Clyde fly it. But Cessna didn't even really know how to fly. And then later on, he began to say, well, I gotta learn how to fly. Now he got some rudimentary, and I mean very rudimentary, tips in New York. But he did not solo, he didn't do anything like that. So it was, uh, that's how he got his start. It's amazing to me, the courage, I think the, uh, I guess the adventurous, spirit that they must have had because this was a group of people who had never flown an airplane before. And it's not like driving a car or riding a bicycle. Flying an airplane carries with it a fair amount of uh, risk. Cessna took a lot of risks trying to master flying on the salt plains of Oklahoma, outside a town named Jet, with his older brother Roy helping out on the ground. Aviation author and historian Ed Phillips talks about all the trials and tribulations Cessna had on the salt planes trying to get and keep his Silver Wings plane airborne. It was hard to fly because he had to teach himself how to fly. And he wasn't sure how to get off the ground. And of course, he was always concerned about landing. Landing was tricky. So what he learned to do was when he was ready to land, he just cut off the engine, just shut it off and just glide down and make the best landing that he could. And that was fraught with peril. On at least a dozen occasions, the landing was so hard, the plane would need rebuilding. He had to try and try and try again, and he could only do that when the wind was favorable and the engine was cooperative. So it took him a long time to, to learn how to do that. Clyde himself would occasionally wind up bruised and battered from those crash landings. On one occasion, Clyde wrote about being sidelined for weeks due to injuries from a crash. It's the kind of bravado that still fascinates modern pilots like former Cessna CEO, Jack Pelton. Can you imagine teaching yourself to fly? Cessna was a successful car salesman in Enid, but cars couldn't hold his interest like flying could. He was one of the best salesmen in Enid for the Overland car. And a matter of fact, he was probably at one point going to run that whole agency there. But when he got enamored and attracted to airplanes, he, and he got that airplane from New York shipped down to Enid and he began to work with it, he quit. Cessna was ready to make a life-changing pivot. Car sales brought him a steady income, but he was willing to give all that up.
for exhibition flying pursuits. And I remember him telling in researching the Enid papers, he told the reporters one day, quoting what he said, he said, I've burned all the bridges behind me. It's aviation or nothing, boys. <laughs> So it was quite a risk, but he was also drawn, uh, Chris, because the fact that he could make $500 to $1,000 for a five-minute flight. And that was far more than he could ever make selling overland cars. So there was a financial attraction to it, not just a mechanical attraction. He was an excellent mechanic to begin with. Eventually, Clyde and Roy got Silver Wings back to flying condition and then ready to make exhibition flights. He was the one who wanted to do exhibitions. He knew that the money was where the exhibitions were, and he was interested in, in making money, but he was also interested in flying. Cessna formed a flying exhibition company. He was the only pilot. I don't think he had a particular plan about either making airplanes or flying exhibitions, but the fact was when he was successful in flying, it was people would gather at little towns, and uh, sometimes he would be successful at flying the airplane, and and sometimes uh, he wouldn't. It was the early day flying exhibitions that first whetted the appetites of Wichitans to fly. There were exhibitions of hot air balloons, including races. In the spring of 1911, a Curtis exhibition team drew thousands to the Walnut Grove area, where 37th Street North and Seneca are now. Flying exhibitions were popular paid attractions in that era, and Clyde Cessna, being the businessman that he was, saw exhibitions as a way to make good money while doing what he loved, flying. Cessna was becoming quite the celebrity with his exhibition flying. He was one of the earliest pioneers in the United States, I would say. That's not too bold to state in terms of exhibition flying. Uh, and he was busy in you know, spring, summer, and the fall, especially with all the, of the fairs and all, that type of thing. Cessna is said to be the first aviator to fly over downtown Wichita in October 1913. Clyde was in Wichita at that time, searching for a place to build airplanes. At the same time, he organized and flew exhibitions in Wichita to pay expenses. Cessna's path crossed with that of J.J. Jones of the Jones Motor Company. Jones built the Jones 6 automobile in the Bridgeport Industrial Area of North Central Wichita. That location is roughly between 30th and 37th Streets North along Santa Fe and Mead Streets. The Cessna Jones acquaintance is a key connection in Wichita's aviation history. It comes at a time when Cessna was ready to burn his Enid bridges and turn his eyes on Wichita for airplane production. And we can thank J.J. Jones for, for helping out with that, who built the Jones 6 up there in the, in the north part of town. Uh, and he wanted Cessna to come and, and actually set up a shop there. But before that happened, he had come to Wichita to fly, you know, some exhibitions and in Wichita. And he used to drop a football, you know, from the airplane. Anybody could caught it, get $5 or whatever it happened to be. So he was, you know, well known around here. The J.J. Jones factory buildings are prominent in early Wichita aviation history. Throughout this documentary, we will show some of the early sites where planes were built. These may surprise you because some of those sites are in, dare I say, plain sight now, but occupied by different businesses. Jones, along with other Wichita boosters, got Cessna to set up shop at the Jones Motor Company in 1916. At last, Cessna was within a grasp of one of his dreams, that of having a place to build airplanes and train pilots, even if it was just to expand his exhibition company. Cessna later said, you know, I, I, flying's fine, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing, flying's fine, but I want to build airplanes. I want my name on a company. I want my name on an airplane. That was really where his true interest was. But the exhibition flying and things, that were a means to get to the point where he could build airplanes, which is why he wanted to start building airplanes in this town. Now here's a question that's been kicked around by aviation enthusiasts. Who should get credit for building the first airplanes in Wichita? Hmm, you think you know? Are you sure? Well, the answer depends on how the question is phrased. I would absolutely argue with anybody. Cessna was the man who started building airplanes in Wichita. He was the first guy. 
But for everyone's understanding of why the question is even raised, I must jump ahead to an aviator named E.M. Matty Laird. We'll get deeper into Laird's Wichita importance a bit later. Matty Laird and others built the Swallow Airplane. What Laird did, and here's the key word, Chris, that I think people miss. Laird built the first production, that's the word, limited production commercial airplane, okay, in the United States, but was not the first airplane available. Phillips' point is planes were being built elsewhere and for sale to customers, but not built in a regular mass production setting, which would soon come to Wichita. What Cessna did, he was the first one to build. I don't think there's any question about that. But Laird was the first one to turn this into a manufacturing town. But before that happens, Cessna starts building planes, including the Comet, at the Jones Motor Car Plant. Old photos show Clyde and his workers posing with the planes in front of Building H. There was enough acreage next to the building for a grass airstrip. You'll notice in some of the, the historical pictures of this facility, especially when Clyde uh, Cessna was in manufacturing his airplanes here, that the building over my right shoulder uh, is pictured in the background with the airplanes uh, a little bit further out uh, in front of it. So the cameraman was actually standing on what we consider to be the landing field, uh, which would be where this red brick building is today uh, with the airplanes here and then the uh, building in the background. Before it was Jones Motor Car, the facility was the Burton Stock Car Company, which built custom railroad cars as far back as 1887. So buildings uh, G and H were located immediately over my right shoulder uh, behind me. Unfortunately, those two buildings were destroyed by fire around 1920. But other buildings that plane makers Cessna, Lloyd Stearman, and Al Mooney later used are still standing and being used for present day manufacturing. <laughs> Johnson Controls, Inc. makes heating and air conditioning units in those same buildings where rail cars, automobiles, and planes were once built. York, Evcon, and Coleman owned and operated from here before Johnson Controls purchased the facilities. Chet Sears of Johnson Controls talks about the rich history in these buildings. So this is the building, uh, the, the best we could tell, goes all the way back to the Burton Stock Car Company. This was uh, where they started manufacturing the rail cars. He says years later, J.J. Jones greatly expanded the campus and had plenty of room to invite Clyde Cessna inside Building 13. This was the main production area for the Jones Automobile Company. And then this, this went straight over to the, the facility that Clyde Cessna was, was using uh, on behalf of the Jones Automobile Company. You can tell from the ceiling beams and walls, this is the same building, which historic photos show of Cessna with his airplanes under construction. To me, this is fascinating local Wichita history. More than a century ago, the Jones Motor Company gave Clyde Cessna the opportunity to build his first airplanes right here in this building. So in late 1916 and into 1917, Clyde Cessna built airplanes right here. The turning point to me was 1916. In 1916, he came up here and established that, uh, not a company per se, except for the exhibition company. He wasn't called a CVC aircraft company, not yet. But he started building airplanes over there in the Jones factory. Cessna's plane building at this location and his exhibition flying came to a halt later in 1917 because of gasoline rationing during World War I. Private flying was basically shut down, and the exhibition company got shut down. At that time, Cessna tried to interest the U.S. Army in buying his planes for war use. He offered his airplane to, at that point, the government, and they turned him down. He said it could be a good airplane for reconnaissance. Well, that didn't work, so he couldn't sell it that way. That started the several year period when Clyde took an aviation break and went back to farming near Rago. Other plane makers mentioned before also got their manufacturing starts here over a several decades period. So this north central Wichita industrial area is connected to a lot of local aviation history. The end of World War I brought changes and opportunities. Fuel rationing ended and domestic flying resumed. There were many ex-military pilots who wanted to keep flying. They were potential customers for airplanes, 
But Ed Phillips says there was a problem. There was virtually no market for new airplanes at that time, although they were available if a person wanted it, but no such thing as production of commercial aircraft did not exist. What was available were those war surplus Curtis JN-4s, otherwise called flying jennies. Thousands of surplus jennies sold at bargain prices. Very affordable. $500 in a tank of gas, and you could fly it away. And so the barnstormers really began to build the aviation industry to a great degree, from coast to coast. About this time, a Pennsylvania transplant by the name of Jacob Jake Molendick was making a fortune as a wildcatter in the oil fields of Oklahoma and Butler County, Kansas. Molendick was also interested in aviation. He believed Wichita should be the place to build airplanes. If you go clear back to 1919 and Jake Melendick, he's the one who envisioned that originally, that yeah, this would be a, not just a place to, to fly airplanes, this is a place to build airplanes, and this is a place to market airplanes and sell airplanes as a transportation tool. And I really credit him with having that vision. Molendick and his partners convinced a young plane designer and builder from Chicago named E.M. Matty Laird to come to Wichita. Mullen Dick saw the value of flying for business. He was already hiring private planes to fly to and from his oil fields. And as a businessman, he foresaw monetizing flying by manufacturing planes in Wichita. He wanted to put his money to work doing that. But what he envisioned was, hey, look at all the advantages we have here in Wichita. We've got, we've got flat ground. You know, we have men who are interested in this. We have some people who could help us out. There's money here, uh, and I've got the money too. We don't have is an airplane. Mullendick convinced Laird Wichita was the place to manufacture his plane. He was a, just a brilliant designer, never a formally trained engineer, but understood things like Clyde. He understood mechanical things, and he knew how to make things work and how to fix them. He lived in Chicago. He built his first airplane in 1913 in the attic of his house, his folks' house. And then later he found an engine and he began to fly it. So he was beginning to get well known up in the Chicago area and he built half a dozen airplanes for different people. So he was way ahead of Clyde, 1914, 1915. He was building airplanes for, for people who wanted to fly them. Something I find fascinating, and I think you will also, is the Laird Airplane Company's first manufacturing site was right about here, where back in 1919, just over a century ago, Wichita and English streets intersected. But those streets no longer intersect because this is the location of Century Two and the Bob Brown Expo Convention Hall. My, how things have changed. Laird's aircraft assembly was actually in the Wichita Forum building complex. The Forum was Wichita's municipal auditorium before Century Two Performing Arts and Convention Center was built. Of all things, Laird first named its new plane after a farm machine. The original name of the aircraft was the Wichita Tractor. And on the maiden flight, I guess Wal Walter Ennis was there and he just proclaimed, it flies just like a swallow, boys and the name stuck, lucky for us. It wasn't called the Wichita Tractor, but the Laird Swallow. That was before aircraft companies, like other product makers, hired marketing firms to help them name and market products, something the Gretemann Group has done for aviation companies for decades. You just don't think of a tractor with wings, come on. You know, I think of a tractor as grounded and aircraft are in the air and the sky. So it was a terrible name. So good for them. Swallow. Yes, Laird Swallow, just like the bird. A replica of the Laird Swallow is on display here at the Kansas Aviation Museum. With the skin removed, you can see how the plane was put together with the wood railing. Jake Mullendick and Matty Laird built 43 of those swallows here in Wichita, but none are known to exist. That's why it's a replica. Laird Aircraft Company got Wichita started in aircraft production. The company is also significant in Wichita's history because of the talent it attracted. In 1920, Laird hired Lloyd Stearman, who later founded his own company. Then, in 1921, Molendick hired Walter Beach to be a part-time demonstrator pilot 
and general employee. But there's something you've got to know about Jake Molendick. He was difficult to get along with. Phillips asked Laird about working with Molendick in a 1982 interview. He said that Jake was just irascible. It was impossible to work with as time went on because Jake wanted it all his way. And Maddie was very meek, humble guy, quiet, and said, you know, Jake, we can't expand, we can't do this, we need to be careful with our money. And Jake said, oh, no, we can do this, we can do this. And that's where he got a lot of trouble with Laird because Jake would go to the papers and make these boasts and these claims and these things he was going to do that Maddie knew were impossible. Laird finally got his fill of Molendick. Laird was fed up and he left and he and Matt and Jake separated on reasonably good terms. He got $1,500 in a couple of airplanes and he left. Laird sold his share of the company and went back to Chicago in 1923. So with Laird gone, the local company was renamed Swallow Airplane Company. By that time, Lloyd Stearman had learned enough about plane design from Laird to move into that role with the Swallow Company. Swallow had moved manufacturing to what is now the 2400 block of North Hillside, just north of then Fairmount College, now Wichita State University. Compare this historic photo to this present day building where a church now meets. It's one of those places we drive by without realizing what once was there. The building now standing is screen left in the photo with the other structures now long gone. If you look in the background across the street, you'll see the old Mission Cemetery. In a bit of irony, that cemetery later became the final resting place for the man whose vision and money got Wichita's plane making off the ground. By the time Jake Molendick died in 1940, the once wealthy oil man was a penniless pauper. It's said that others even had to pay for his burial here at the Old Mission Cemetery in Northeast Wichita. Stearman and Beach recognized it was time to transition from wood to steel tubing and plain construction, but Molendick wouldn't budge on their suggestion. So Beach and Stearman knew they'd have to take their idea out on their own, but they needed others' help. They flew their swallow to Cessna's Rago farm to invite Cessna to join them. It was just the ticket to revive Cessna's plane making dreams. He bankrolled Travel Air for the most part. Clyde, Clyde Cessna bankrolled Travel Air to the tune of $25,000 to help him get going. Now, all together, those aviation visionaries formed the Travel Air Company in 1925. Walter Ennis Jr owner of the Ennis department store in Wichita and also a local investor became president of the company. Cessna, with the money and tools he brought, was vice president, Beach was secretary and Stearman chief engineer. It was the start of a highly significant part of Wichita's aviation history. Traveler became a big deal in aviation. Big, big deal. And and was very successful in its early days and, and produced some fantastic airplanes. And again, produced people who became the leaders in the industry going off and doing it on their own at other companies. Travel Air had to scramble to find manufacturing space. The company first set up shop in the Kansas Planing Mill around First Street and the Arkansas River behind the Broadview Hotel. Although Travel Air first started building their planes on the east bank of the river at the old Kansas planing mill, they quickly ran out of space. So they moved over here to the west bank of the river in the Delano area. And they were building planes in these red brick buildings you see behind me. This is the 500 block of West Douglas. Try to picture it in 1925 when it was packed full of airplane tooling jigs. The building's owner had murals painted honoring the aviation history made here by Cessna, Beach, and Stearman. You know, that we're here in, in the main part of the history. The hairstylists working at Salon 535 know nearly a century ago, some of Wichita's early day airplanes were built where they work now. We like our building and we like the fact that it's got all the history. I mean, that history plus the earlier history and then later on down the road, yeah, we, we like it. We like being in the center of it all. The structure is now divided into smaller suites with several businesses occupying them. One of those is the sweet and saucy shop full of bottled soda, candy, 
salsas, and more. I don't know if it would be easier to get a better shot of it arching from back here. A look at the arch ceiling is reminiscent of the way it was in 1925 when Clyde Cessna, Walter Beach, and Lloyd Stearman worked together to build their travel airplanes here. I just knew that it had the arch had to deal with having bigger aircraft parts coming in and out. Mm -hmm. So where airplane wings and fuselages once occupied the floor space, now all sorts of sweets and sauces fill store shelves. Store employees know a little bit about what went on here, and so do some of their customers. You know, the aircraft plants were our livelihood. It was Wichita. Yeah, still kind of is. <laughs> Jonah Fussell reminds us how much aviation dominated the city back then, sharing a memory from her Jefferson Elementary School's playground. Instead of numbering off one, two, three, one, two, three, and then in the, the person in the middle would say three and all the threes would have to run around, instead of uh, numbering, we would say Beach Boeing Cessna, Beach Boeing Cessna. Beach, Cessna, and others would compete in and win races with travel airplanes, which helped win new aircraft orders. They were going gangbusters here. And building five to ten airplanes a week over at Travel Air was a phenomenal production rate. No one had ever thought it would get that good. But that also meant more growing pains for Travel Air. Then, in 1927, Charles Lindbergh planned his New York to Paris flight attempt. He wired Walter Beach asking Travel Air to build the plane for the transatlantic crossing. Now Beach considered it, but turned Lindbergh down because Travel Air had too many orders already. Lindbergh's successful flight only added fuel to the aviation frenzy. Orders poured in. During 1927, after Lindbergh, aviation just blew up in the United States, just exploded. Everybody wanted an airplane, everybody was going to have a, you know, learn to fly. The West Douglas Delano site was so cramped, workers were bumping into each other. Company leaders and city boosters were scrambling again for a new location. That resulted in Travel Air moving in 1929 to East Central and Webb Road. Years later, in 1934, it became home of Beach Aircraft. The site remains as part of the Textron Aviation Beach facilities. Travel Air really had a grip on, uh, on the market at that time. But Wichita overall was, the, was really the king of the production at that time. The world was taking notice of Wichita, recognizing the city as the preeminent manufacturing center for aircraft. That led to the Aeronautical Chamber of Commerce in 1929, proclaiming Wichita America's air capital city. Well, Wichita boosters took that proclamation a step further by amplifying on it and proclaimed Wichita the air capital of the world. That's how the city came to that title. Well, I think the city, you know, the Aeronautical Chamber of Commerce in Oakley realized that they had a gem here in Wichita being a manufacturing hub. The number of aviation companies in Wichita was ballooning. Well, there was at least 19 or 20 different airframe manufacturers because of that resurgence after Lindbergh flew the Atlantic. That really sparked a lot of interest in aviation. In his book, Travel Air, Wings Over the Prairie, Phillips writes there were also 13 airplane and engine service facilities, nine air transportation companies, and 13 flight schools for ground and air instruction. This was really the epicenter of a lot of that interest because the airplanes, they thought, well, everybody's going to have an airplane, everybody's going to fly. And that was, uh, of course, a bit of a dream. Now, we won't mention all of those Wichita aircraft companies that started in the 1920s because there were so many that were trying to get in on the aircraft making craze here locally. One of them, Watkins Aircraft, which made the Watkins Skylark shown here. But it, too, went bankrupt after building only five of these. Watkins built planes in this building, still standing at 2300 East Douglas across the street from Wichita East High School. Meanwhile, back at Travel Air, as successful as it was becoming, it couldn't contain all the creativity its founders had. Even while Clyde Cessna was still with the Travel Air Company, he kept his own workshop here at 1520 West Douglas, where he worked on his own designs and his own ideas for airplanes. 
Hearsay history is all over the place with this city, and some of it's really bad. One of those bad ones, according to Phillips, has to do with the thought that Beach and Cessna disagreed over whether a plane should have one wing, a monoplane, or two wings, the biplane. One of them is that Walter Beach was never against monoplanes. You always see Walter Beach was the biplane man and the biplane man. No. Walter Beach was with one thing. Would it sell? Let's build it. After all, Phillips says, Travel Air built and sold several of these Cessna-designed monoplanes to National Air Transport for mail and passenger flights. So, Travel Air built both biplanes and monoplanes. Now, early on, while Cessna, Beach, and Stearman were busy building and selling planes, they needed someone to run the front office. A young woman by the name of Olive Ann Meller answered their ad. Well, she'd gone to secretarial school, so she had skills, and they needed a secretary. So I think she thought she'd be a good one. And, and she certainly was. Turned out she was. Miller came with experience managing an office and keeping books, but it didn't take long for Walter Beach to notice and take an interest in Olive Ann. I think it's true that my father liked pretty women, and I they probably, you know, I don't know how quickly, but as she the, was the only woman, it'd be hard to miss her. Beach's interest in Miller was obvious to others, especially to Cessna, who hired Olive Ann. Now, as the old story goes, which I could never verify, that Walter laid eyes on Olive Ann and that was it. <laughs> That's what Mr. Cessna said. And he even told Walter after a couple of weeks, why don't you just marry the girl? That's basically what he was like. The story does go that Mr. Cessna said, well, you know, why don't you marry her if you're so enchanted by her? So I think he supposedly, I don't know whether he planted that seed, but encouraged that perhaps. There's a story about Beach taking Olive Ann for her first flight. It was an open air plane. Meller insisted on having a calm flight, no tricks. <laughs> Beach thought, yeah, right. Well, he wanted to take her for a ride and she said, yes, I'll go, but you know, don't do any shenanigans. And of course, my father was very mischievous, I think, and of course did do loops or whatever. And supposedly she somehow hid and he thought he'd lost her. So he had to land the plane and go look. The story is, Olive Ann hid well enough in the plane, Beach really thought she had fallen out. He lands and goes to the Meller house to break what he thought was the sad news. When he went to her parents' house, she answered the door and gave him quite a fright. And yeah, I think she, you know, she wasn't one to be taken advantage of. The young secretary from the small Kansas town of Waverly in Coffee County showed Walter she wasn't to be toyed with. I think they were a very wonderful, dynamic duo that worked well together. Each had their own qualities that helped them achieve things, and they complemented each other, I think. And I think they, I, of course, I don't know, I was just a young girl, but they didn't seem to have the friction or you know, they seem to get along very well. Mary Lynn grew up hearing some of the tough time stories before Traveler's success when Beach competed in races and flew exhibitions in order to make money to meet payroll. I remember her talking about the air shows and how they had to go out and sell the tickets. And they had to sell the tickets so they had enough money to pay their employees. There's more to come on the beaches later. But back at Travel Air, the company was having success. Even so, both Lloyd Stearman and Clyde Cessna sold their shares to move on and form their own companies. Cessna's interest was also proving his design for a full cantilevered wing plane could be certified and would sell. For the non-aviator, a quick lesson here. Non-cantilever wings have external supports, whereas a cantilever wing has no external supports. Cessna demonstrated the strength of his cantilever wings by loading sandbags and people on them. Cessna soon realized his workshop on West Douglas simply wasn't large enough to be a factory. 
Cessna's first real aircraft factory was right here, where West 2nd and Glen Avenue intersect in West Wichita. It's just south of the West Side athletic fields that many Wichitans drive by daily on McLean. This factory was opened in 1927. This facility remains part of Wichita's aviation manufacturing sector. Apex Engineering International currently makes aircraft components here. From the air, the round top buildings, which date back to Cessna's occupation, are visible. Newer buildings have since been added. Compare these modern visuals to the photographs from back then. There was a 40 acre field giving pilots enough room to fly away newly built planes from. Now just think, housing surrounds this facility now. For a short time in 1927, it was called the Cessna Roos Company when Victor Roos partnered with Cessna. Mr. Roos was soon bought out and booted out by Cessna's board of directors. Clyde finally got his own company off the ground and had lots of plane orders coming in. There were so many orders, Cessna outgrew the second in Glenside. So, in March 1929, Cessna broke ground on what then was called Franklin Road, but is now popularly known as the Pawnee Plant. The company needed the larger factory to meet a large order of planes for the Curtis Wright Company. He was just getting to the point where he was able to begin to meet the high demand from Curtis Wright for airplanes when the crash came. The economic crash known as the Great Depression put an end to the prosperous Roaring Twenties and brought back to earth Wichita's high-flying aircraft manufacturing. So Mr. Cessna, you can't help but feel sorry for him. He's, his dream was just about to happen when the bubble burst. So what happened then was, you know, he couldn't sell the airplanes. He couldn't sell them for half price. And, and some of these uh, AWs and Cessna DC-6s that were supposed to sell for twelve dollars and $14,000, if you look at the ads back then in the papers, Brand new, two hours of flying time on this Cessna DC-6, and they'll sell it for 3,000 bucks. Anything to get money out of it, huge losses. And of course, eventually, uh, it cost Mr. Cessna his job. Plane sales stopped. Cessna planes were left on the production line without buyers for them. Cessna's board of directors took action. They said, we need to close the factory. Mr. Cessna, who's president, he said, no, let's just keep trying. We'll just keep trying to sell these airplanes. And they said, no. So eventually, they locked the plant and, and fired Mr. Cessna. That's really what happened. You're out. And at that point, and they kept it. And it stayed that way for quite some time. It was a devastating blow. Cessna said he turned the keys over and never looked back at the building that was no longer his. Massive layoffs came to Wichita's factories. Now they tried to keep going, Cessna tried to keep going, Stearman kept going, Travel Air kept going. There were others in town too, a lot of your young startups you know, as well, startup companies. They didn't last. Most of them were gone within a year and never really produced aircraft. On the other hand, Walter Beach's market timing could hardly have been much better. Travel Air stockholders, including Beach, sold their stock at a high price to the larger Curtis Wright Corporation in August 1929 before the crash. This led to the Beaches leaving the air capital. Walter would go to work for the Curtis Wright Corporation. But before leaving, Mr. Beach had an exit interview with local reporters. He wasn't ashamed to talk about his rags to riches success after coming to Wichita. He said, go get a picture of me when I first came here. I've, I've done well and I'm not ashamed to say so. That's exactly what he told him. So he wasn't, he wasn't afraid to say that. He was poor as he could be when he first came. But by 1929, he was a nationally and to some degree internationally recognized uh, businessman and, and uh, as well as being a pilot and an aviation person. You could say Beach was both a show off as well as being good with employees. Bit of a showboat, that's correct. But everybody I talked to, they're all dead now. The traveler employees always said he was fair. He was a fair man. He'd come out, work with him on a production line and all that. But as time went by, he became more and more business suit, marketing, sell, sell, sell. You know, he, was a, he knew how to sell airplanes. The Depression eventually halted Curtis Wright's production of travel air models. 
Meanwhile, back at Travel Air, they had laid off almost everybody by mid-1930, and there was just a few airplanes being built. Phillips says the Wichita Stearman plant was able to hang on. That's because, he says, it had been purchased by the United Aircraft and Transport Corporation, which also owned Boeing. And they kept Stearman alive with small subcontracts for the Boeing 247 airliner. Walter and Ollie Van Beach moved from Wichita to New York, where Walter worked as a Curtis Wright vice president. His executive hours sometimes caused him to miss or arrive late to Ollie Van's well-prepared dinners. And he was late, so he came home and she became, she was angry and threw the bowl of mashed potatoes against the wall. Ollie Van was fed up with life in New York. Supposedly that led to her leaving. So Ollie Van, as the story goes, boarded a train to Kansas by herself when Walt makes a dramatic and romantic intervention. He flew the plane and he landed on the train tracks train stop and got on the train and found her and apologized and off they flew and that was a pretty romantic story. <laughs> it's pretty, you know, that would kind of make you uh, appreciate this person. Beach wanted to start calling his own shots again rather than working for others. That, despite having a secure job during the Great Depression. And they were risk takers and they were adventuresome and they were, I think they believed in what they could do together. The Beaches returned to the air capital to start their own company. And according to this story told to Ed Phillips by Eldon Cessna, Clyde's son, Beach wanted Cessna to join in the new venture. But he said, a lot of people don't know that Mr. Beach contacted my dad in 1932 and wanted him to come in on the company. But Dad said no. And many don't know the history of why Cessna said no. They were competitors, but they were also friends. Phillips says Clyde and his son Eldon built and flew racing planes after Cessna aircraft was closed. A close Cessna friend, Roy Liggett, also flew Cessna racers in those pylon races. But tragedy struck when Liggett was doing a speed dash. The plane came apart in flight, ripping a wing off and the airplane just rolled right into the ground and killed Liggett. That is when Clyde Cessna quit aviation. Indisputable. He said, that's it. And because of that, a potential Beach-Cessna collaboration didn't happen. Beach went ahead and formed Beach Aircraft Company in 1932 with Walter and Ollie Van as co-founders. Ted Wells was chief engineer and designer. But since Travel Air still owned the Central and Webb Road factory, Beach needed a place to set up shop. Well, Cessna comes through for Beach, renting a part of its closed factory for Beach's stagger wing production. So think about that. Beach gets its start at Cessna. Beach's Wichita return gave hope during a desperate time in Wichita's history. And it kind of got Wichita reawakened, you know, to the possibilities of aviation. But I don't think we should leave out the fact of the amount of guts it took for Walter and Olive Ann, and to some degree Ted, to come back here and start that company in the midst of the worst economic depression the country had ever seen. Some thought Walter was crazy, but it was Wells' design of this plane to become known as the Stagger Wing, which Beach believed would sell. He didn't sell an airplane for two years. The Stagger Wing was a luxurious plane at a time when people couldn't afford luxuries. Decades later, Phillips was doing research for his book on the Stagger Wing. Phillips says he interviewed Ollie Van Beach about that period when Beach Aircraft had no income from selling airplanes. He asked how closely the company came to going bankrupt. And I asked her that question about the fact that they were running low on money. And I know that because of the records that I was able to, to see out of uh, the Beach archives. And Ted Wells wrote to the, to the Civil Aeronautics Administration and said, basically, we need to sell this airplane. The, the customer wants to deliver it, wants to deliver it on June 16th. If we don't do this, he's likely to do something. Can you do anything to help a starving airplane company, quote unquote? Now, I asked her about that, and she says, well, Mr. Phillips, we were never going to be bankrupt. And that was all she said. Now, however, 
they came close. I think they came perilously close to going under. But Beach managed to hold on during the Depression's darkest days long enough to sell some planes, though it was a struggle. Wichita was establishing itself as the air capital for its airplane production. But all those planes were taking off and landing on grass strips. Local leaders saw a need for a municipal airport suitable for commercial flights, cross-country mail delivery, and general aviation. Well, and, and I believe they started to see that it wasn't about just manufacturing, but it was flight in general and how it was taking off in, a, in America and, and across the world. In 1928, the city of Wichita purchased land for a municipal airport. However, by the time construction was ready, the Depression hit delaying the project. They designed it and started in 1929, but it wasn't finished till 35, and it became a WPA project. So this beautiful Art Deco building was built by the Work Progress Administration. Norton says Wichita's original municipal airport was the fourth busiest in the U.S. during the decade of the 1940s. And it was a very busy airport during the war years because of military travel, because the planes were being military planes were being manufactured here, and that it was a great stopping off point for refueling. After World War II, the Air Force gained control of the airport and runways to establish McConnell Air Force Base. Today, the former airport terminal is home to the Kansas Aviation Museum. Here on display at the Kansas Aviation Museum is a Wichita-built Mooney M18 Mite. Why bring this up? Well, Mooney Aircraft is one of those 1920s era Wichita aircraft startup companies which can be so easily overlooked and forgotten about. Al Mooney no sooner started building his planes in 1929 in Wichita, but months later had to close due to the stock market crash and Great Depression. So Mooney left Wichita, then returned after the war in 1946 to restart production. Mooney left Wichita again for the last time in 1953 to move his company to Kerrville, Texas, where it has struggled to remain open. In the Depression years 1931 through 33, the Cessna plant was closed. In 1933, the only activity at Cessna was Beach building stagger wings. It was the same year Clyde Cessna's nephew, Dwayne Wallace, graduated from Wichita University with an aeronautical engineering degree. Dwayne then worked for Beach, but soon set his eyes on reopening the Cessna factory. Together with his older brother, Dwight, a lawyer, the Wallace boys approached their uncle Clyde to throw in with them. They asked him, and he, they, he said, according to Mr. Wallace, I will help you in name only. That's it. I'm not getting involved with airplanes anymore. The Wallace boys won a proxy vote with stockholders to reopen the plant. Hostile stockholders wanted to sell it off piece by piece. That was the rebirth of the Cessna Aircraft Company. It was another sign of hope for the air capital. The revived company's first plane was the C-34, which later became the C-37. It was a design Duane came up with while in college. It was said to be the right plane at the right time. Dwayne won races with it, bringing great acclaim. The C-34 was called the world's most efficient airplane. At last, Clyde Cessna was getting some redemption. Mr. Cessna was wonderfully happy to get his airplane company back because he thought it was on, you know, improperly taken from him to begin with. At this point, Clyde was staying in the background, letting his nephews and others carry the ball. Then, in 1936, Cessna officially retires to his Rago farm at age 57. Duane worked tirelessly traveling the country, promoting the company to get a new foothold. Decades later, after the young man had grown into an aviation legend, he tells former Cake TV anchor Larry Hatterberg about that humble work ethic. I'm just an ordinary guy that's, that's worked hard. That's something you like to do. Now we'll hear more from Dwayne Wallace and wife Velma later. But we dare not forget the great contributions Lloyd Stearman and the Stearman Aircraft Company made to Wichita. Stearman formed Stearman Aircraft after leaving Travel Air and built planes in the old Jones Auto Plant in North Wichita. At a point, Stearman moved the company to California. 
Without success there, Wichita boosters, including Walter Annis, got him to return and restart his company in Wichita. This is a Stearman aircraft built back in Wichita in 1931. Now, have you ever considered that if Boeing's parent company hadn't taken an interest in buying the Stearman Aircraft Company, Boeing wouldn't have had a reason to be located right here in Wichita. Wichita's history would have been so much different. In 1927, Stearman was building civil and mail delivery planes. Two years later, in 1929, company leaders sold Stearman to United Aircraft and Transport Corporation, which also owned Boeing. Being owned by United afforded Stearman to expand. United built the Stearman plant on South Oliver, which later became Boeing's Plant One, and remains today with Spirit Aerosystems. But the U.S. government passed legislation forcing United to sell off its divisions, citing United as an aviation monopoly. That's when Stearman became a Boeing subsidiary. I think the interest was with Stearman Aircraft. I mean, Stearman built trainers. Jeff Turner was the first CEO of Spirit Aerosystems. Before that, his career was with Boeing as general manager of Boeing's Wichita division. Before Spirit built these large aircraft assemblies, before Boeing built great bombers, the plant built Stearman military training aircraft. In the mid-1930s, world militaries saw the need to purchase the now Boeing Stearman trainers. The U.S. needed trainers in a bad way with war erupting in Europe. So they began to ramp up because we were so far behind other nations militarily in the mid-1930s and it had to be increased. More than 10,600 Model 75 trainers were built by the Wichita plant. Many still fly today. Wichita plane makers transitioned from little work during the Depression to being called upon to rapidly ramp up wartime plane production. Stearman was really the strong one there in the mid-1930s and late 1930s, and Beach was gaining ground, stability. Cessna was gaining ground and stability at that point. Wichita plane makers found their footing building military training aircraft. Beach's Model 18 and Cessna's T-50 were originally civilian designs, but the military needed them. We built a very good training airplane called the Bobcat. Uh, Beach built a wonderful airplane called the C-45. The military bought Beach and Cessna planes by the thousands to train bombers and navigators. The planes were also used for utility purposes. A lesser known plane maker, Culver Aircraft Company, built airplanes in Wichita during the war years, including radio controlled drones used for target practice. It was controlled by Walter Beach and Charles Yankee and operated in secrecy in the air capital. Suddenly, Wichita's factories were awash with military orders. The plants had to go on hiring sprees. Take Beach Aircraft, for example. Just before the war, it had 700 employees. At its wartime height, it employed 17,700. Wichita turned into a boomtown, with many restaurants and other businesses open around the clock, serving aircraft shift workers. Wartime housing sprung up rapidly for all those workers. Production lines ramped up, and Wichita factories needed to hire thousands of skilled workers. The city was rapidly changing.